This lecture is going to focus on Hartree-Fock theory, not as we've seen it up till now, which is the semi-empirical implementation where approximations are made in replacing certain kinds of integrals, but instead we're going to look at ab initio Hartree-Fock theory, that is, from the beginning. And in particular, after a brief review, I'm going to focus on basis sets and their use in ab initio calculations to construct linear combination of atomic orbital type wave functions. In terms of review, I want to take you all the way back to sort of the foundational principles of quantum mechanics. And uh, they're all chunked here into a single slide, which I, I may have shown before. But the fundamental postulate of quantum mechanics is that there is this thing called a wave function that buried inside the wave function is all the information about the system that is necessary to, to derive any property of the system. And the way in which we obtain those properties is that there is some operator which acting on the wave function will return an observable. And when the wave function is an eigenfunction in particular, this rather simple looking equation holds. So the problem with the wave function, of course, is that it's, it's conceptually a little bit opaque. It's kind of difficult to really grasp what's in a wave function. We've seen a fair amount of them now, and hopefully you've come to appreciate better that it's a uh, anti-symmetrized product, this is what we usually work with, an anti-symmetrized product of some rather complex three-dimensional functions. But in any case, if we just stick at the conceptual level, I like to tell people that a wave function is an oracle, right? You ask it questions by probing it with an operator, and it gives you answers which tell you, you know, what's the observable property you would expect based on that operator. And in fact, where do we get these wave functions from? Well, as theoreticians or computational chemists, we refine them, and that process of refinement is the variational process. That is, we are armed with the variational principle that says when we apply the Hamiltonian operator to any wave function, we will never get an energy out that is lower than the correct energy associated with the exact wave function, which we often don't know. And so our goal tends to be to try rationally to improve the wave function and we judge whether we have improved it by using different mathematical functions to construct it, uh, our judge is uh, the energy. So if the energy goes down, we must be approaching truth. So that's what I have here. Convergence of energy leads to truth. And then there is this question, well, what if I can't uh, converge E, test your oracle with a question to which you already know the right answer? So that's where, uh, in the semi-empirical regime, for instance, where we're not actually going to try to keep making more and more complex and expensive wave functions, we're going to stop at some point, we're not going to converge E, and we're going to evaluate whether we stopped at a reasonable point by actually doing calculations and validating against known experimental data, for example. And if we do pretty well, we're going to feel comfortable with that level of approximation. But today I don't want to talk about semi-empirical. I want to think about doing this more, uh, more rigorously in some sense. And I've already shown this slide in the past. This is just a, an example of a one electron wave function. That is, it is the exact solution to the one electron Schrodinger equation for a single atom. And one of those solutions, this is a 2p orbital, and so this just illustrates that these are mathematical functions, and if I express it in Cartesian coordinates for a given nuclear charge z, here is a properly normalized atomic orbital wave function that falls out exactly from solution of the Schrodinger equation. And I show this because to the extent we're going to need to use mathematical functions even in more complex systems like molecules with many electrons, certainly it's kind of a reasonable guess that functions that will be useful in terms of being efficient to build molecular wave functions may well be atomic orbital wave functions. Uh, they've got, if they've got the right shape for atoms, then hopefully they're a good approximation to shapes that will be need to be put together to describe electron density in molecules. And I emphasized in a prior lecture that although it's a reasonable assumption to say that atomic orbitals could be useful basis functions, it's by no means the only possible basis function. So really our only goal is to come up with a set of functions that can describe the varying amplitude of the electron density in space. And one could do that so many different ways. So I've talked about atomic orbitals up till now, and so this CH bond 
might be derived from some linear combination of a carbon s orbital and a carbon p orbital and a hydrogen s orbital and maybe a hydrogen p orbital not because hydrogen's using the p orbital in a sort of formal sense like some excited state hydrogen it's just a function and it helps to polarize this spherical density towards the carbon atom so some small admixture of this might be valuable but an alternative would be simply to sum together s orbitals along the axis of the ch bond and that too if i add together all these densities it looks kind of like this uh, sigma bond would look and that's just to emphasize that functions are functions it's just math at a certain point it's chemists who really like atomic orbitals but if you were a straight mathematician there would be no clear reason why you should give one set of basis functions uh, any more precedent than another. Okay, and our goal in the variational process then is that we are indeed going to take these uh, molecular orbital wave functions, which are expressed as a linear combination of basis functions, and we will evaluate the energy by looking at the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, and just in case they're not normalized, we will uh, divide by the overlap integral of the individual MOs. And we've already discussed in semi-empirical theory that in order to minimize this energy, which is our goal, we want to solve a secular determinantal equation where we will extract roots E that cause this determinant to be equal to zero. And for every one of those roots E, we will get a unique set of coefficients that multiply our basis functions and describe a different molecular orbital. And the integrals themselves that are buried in that uh, h, hij is an orbital h orbital integrated over all space, include kinetic energy integrals, one electron nuclear attraction integrals to all the various nuclei, and finally the repulsion of the electrons with all the other electrons, and this is slightly sloppily written, but it just gives you the idea of when there are many electrons, you need to include their mutual uh, repulsion one with another. And it's that last term that's a little bit tricky. Uh, and the Hartree-Fock approach gets at this term by saying, well, I will not interact instantaneously one electron with another, but rather every electron in a molecular orbital will see the average of all the other electrons in their own orbitals. That's the Hartree-Fock approximation. And when it's a many electron uh, wave function, if we build that many electron wave function, which we know needs to be anti-symmetric, as an anti-symmetrized product of one electron molecular orbitals, and we call that a Slater determinant, then the whole determinantal approach can be sort of chunked in one slide again into the Hartree-Fock procedure. And we've looked at this slide previously. There's still a determinantal equation from which roots E are extracted. Every one of those roots E leads to different molecular orbitals. But we have this funny term in the Fock matrix that involves the density matrix. The density matrix tells us the degree to which individual basis functions, lambda and sigma, are contributing to occupied molecular orbitals, and hence the degree to which these electron-electron repulsions, which are computed for all possible basis set interactions, uh, contribute to the actual molecule, because if the basis functions aren't really used in any of the orbitals, then who cares how electrons occupying those basis functions would interact with one another. Okay, so again, that was sort of review, and I know that went fast, but just recall that we do have all these various integrals we need to evaluate, and in semi-empirical theory, we had a series of approximations ranging from very extreme, like the complete neglect of differential overlap, which gets rid of almost all of these two electron integrals, to uh, NDDO, neglect of diatomic differential overlap, which saved many of them. But I don't want to focus anymore on these kinds of approximations. I want to ask the question, what if I really want to evaluate all of these integrals? So here's the two electron, and sometimes called four index, because it runs over four different basis functions, uh, integral. How might I go about actually computing that? And to date, because we've really been focusing on uh, basis sets being derived from uh, solutions to the one electron Schrodinger equation for a single atom. That's where we get atomic orbitals. We've really been talking about sort of Slater type orbitals. This is another name for them. That is orbitals which if it's a 1s orbital for example 
decays as e to the, there should be a minus sign here, e to the minus zeta r, and then this is a normalization factor. So if you've noticed that these slides seem to have changed format, uh, that's because I am now actually taking advantage of some slides that were created by a former student of mine, uh, now faculty member, recently promoted and tenured, congratulations, uh, Joe Scanlon. He's now at Ripon College in Wisconsin, and as part of preparing future faculty when he was here as a student, he did some guest lectures in computational chemistry, and it's sort of a pleasure to take advantage of some slides he created at the time and uh, honor his contributions that way. So we're going to continue here with some of Joe's slides. All right, but uh, Joe did leave out a minus sign here, but we'll ignore that for the moment. Um, so this uh, exponential decay that is linear in R in the uh, exponent is characteristic of actual atomic systems. The electron density decays exponentially. However, if you were to take Slater type orbitals with this e to the minus zeta r dependence and place them into a generic four index integral and uh, the intent then would be that mu, nu, lambda, and sigma those could be basis functions that even though they're Slater type orbitals each one might be on a different atom so mu would be at one position in space, nu would be at another position in space, lambda yet another, and sigma yet a fourth and the problem is there is no analytic way to solve this integral in that case. No one has ever figured out a way to write down just as sort of a function of the, the exponents and the nuclear positions what would be the value of this integral. Now, you can solve it numerically, and there are codes that have actually developed extremely efficient quadrature approaches. That's usually how you solve an integral numerically. But uh, it was not terribly convenient when people were first thinking about this. And so in the 1950s, Boys, uh, a theoretical chemist, made a suggestion, and that was instead of using a Slater type function, which decays exponentially with r, why not use a Gaussian type function? And so here I've got 1s in quotes because it's no longer a 1s in the sense of it's an exact solution to the one electron Schrodinger equation. Instead, it approximates that solution, but the difference is that it now decays exponentially with r squared, not with r. So that means it's going to die off a little bit too quickly with r. This is the normalization factor that's appropriate for a Gaussian in, in three dimensions. And I've changed the name of the exponent from zeta to alpha just to sort of keep these things distinct. But here's a, a graphical picture of what that looks like. So if blue is the 1s Slater function, and you see this exponential decay, the red line is the Gaussian function, and so you see it decays more quickly. It begins more slowly, because when r is less than 1, r squared is smaller than r. And then at 1, it is exactly equal, r squared to r. And then after 1, it starts decaying a little bit too quickly. Notice another uh, difference between the two is a Slater-type function actually has a cusp at the nuclear position, right? It is non-differentiable. Uh, well, if I were to go in this direction, there'd be a sharp point here but the Gaussian is nice and smooth and differentiable at the nuclear position. So that's a behavior that's inconsistent with uh, actual solutions to the one electron Schrodinger equation. But we can do better and better actually if instead of using only a single Gaussian to represent a Slater function, we treat the Slater function itself much like a molecular orbital is constructed out of atomic orbital basis functions, we can actually treat the individual basis functions as things that are constructed out of a linear combination of other mathematical functions. So in other words, this is a single basis function, but I'm going to build it out of multiple functions. And in particular, I'm going to use Gaussians. So shown here is a sum of three Gaussians. There's this blue curve, and it almost looks like a line, and that's because it has a very, very small value of alpha, so it decays very, very slowly. And then there's a green curve with a somewhat bigger value of alpha in the Gaussian, and so it decays more rapidly. And finally, there's a red curve, and you see that it dies off relatively quickly, so it has the biggest uh, exponent alpha. But if I add together the red, the green, and the blue curves, I'll get the purple curve, and the purple curve is labeled STO3G because it is a Slater-type 
orbital approximated by the sum of three Gaussians. So this curve, the STO3G curve, is the sum of those three other curves. And you see that it's matching the Slater function much more closely than what I showed you in the last slide, where we only had a, a single function, a single Gaussian, attempting to sort of reproduce a Slater. Here, we'll actually go backwards and look at that. So right there were big gaps in this function in terms of its ability to match red over blue. But here, if you look at purple, really quite early on, we start to get very good agreement. And as we go out further and further, it's, it's still pretty good. All right, and so this approach of combining so-called primitive Gaussians, where we are optimizing these values of A that are multiplying the individual primitives in order to construct a so-called contracted basis function. So it's a single basis function, but it is contracted as a sum of primitive Gaussians. And so if you want to really be clear on the difference between a, a linear combination of atomic orbitals MO and a contracted basis function, the difference is in the LCAO expansion, I'm solving the Hartree-Fock procedure in order to find the best coefficients that I'm going to use to build my MOs. But in contracted basis functions, these are set in stone. STO3G refers to a table in a paper somewhere that says if you want to build this function as best you can to make it look like a 1S for use in molecular calculations, use these coefficients. And they're not allowed to vary, they're just there. And it gives you this shape, and that's the shape that you'll use. Now, when you actually do calculations, of course, you're going to expand it into these things because you'll be doing integrals over these functions because they appear in this function. Okay, so this is just another picture of uh, the STO3G approach. So the green is the sum of the red, blue, and yellow. And in general, John Popel, so you remember he was very uh, active in semi-empirical molecular orbital theory. Well, while Dewar and Stewart and others decided to keep exploring that, Popel made the jump to ab initio theory and began optimizing basis sets for use in ab initio Hartree-Fock calculations. And in particular, he looked at a number of STO number G. So you don't have to just add together three. Presumably, if I added together four, I'd do even better. And six, better still. And 10, I could have a fabulous function with STO 10 G. Now, keep in mind that as I increase this number N here, I'm going to get more and more of these functions that are going to appear in every single integral. So I'm going to have a whole bunch of integrals over primitives that I'm going to have to compute. And I might want to keep that down. But in any case, uh, the practical ones that people used for a little while were STO3G and also STO6G enjoyed some popularity. These basis sets are called minimal basis sets because they tend to be used as there would be a single STO, let's say 3 for the moment, STO3G function, a single one of these functions for every core and valence orbital that an atom would be expected to use in molecular bonding. So for a hydrogen, there would only be a single one of these basis functions corresponding to the 1s orbital. For a carbon, there would be a single 1s, a single 2s, and then three p's, that is a single 2px, a single 2py, and a single 2pz. So that would be a total of five functions, right? 1s, 2s, 2px, 2py, 2pz and so on. You could just go through the periodic table and you would optimize, Popel optimized these values of A to best reproduce the shapes of those functions. But here's an interesting question. Uh, think about the bonding in hydrogen fluoride compared to molecular hydrogen. That bonding is very different, right? The fluorine being much more electronegative really pulls density away from the hydrogen atom. Whereas in molecular hydrogen, of course, the density, while it is in between the two atoms, on sort of an average sense, it's closer to, I'll just focus on this H as kind of a reference H. This H gets to keep a lot more of its density. So if I think about representing that in a molecular orbital corresponding to this sigma bond, you know, I'd sort of like to be able to use a function on this H that decays more slowly so that I'll be able to describe amplitude over here close to the F. Now, of course, the F has its own functions too, but the point is, this looks more like an H plus 
and this looks a little bit more like an H dot in some sense. And to add to that flexibility, maybe what I ought to do is, in my basis set, let hydrogen have more than one 1s orbital. Right? Now I, I even should maybe stop calling them orbitals. They're just functions. They're functions that are meant to be spherically symmetric, the way a 1s orbital is spherically symmetric, but I'll have a, maybe a tight function and a loose function. And it's up to the variational process to decide what are the coefficients that those two functions will be multiplied by in any given molecular orbital. So that philosophy is referred to as a multiple zeta basis set, where multiple could be double, triple, quadruple, and it's an indication of for every nominal orbital, that is a 1s or a 2s or a 3d or what have you, how many functions will I provide that are meant to represent that orbital, some looser, some tighter. So a double zeta would be a single loose and a single tight function, and clearly that's more mathematically flexible. Here is a picture of a triple zeta, and in a sense it doesn't look any different than pictures I've shown already having three curves, but the point is when these were primitive functions, they were multiplied together in a specific way with specific coefficients to build a single shape. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to specify the coefficients ahead of time. I'm going to let each of these curves be its own basis function, and the coefficients in the MOs will be optimized by the variational process. Okay? Uh, often, people will make this approximation of, I shouldn't say approximation, I guess I'll, they'll take this step, only for valence functions. And that's recognition in some sense that bonding, which gives rise to this variation, so sometimes a bond will be stretched in one direction and sometimes it'll be stretched in a different direction, uh, that involves valence orbitals primarily. Core orbitals, on the other hand, so a 1s orbital in carbon, for example, those typically are not very much influenced by substituents. And as a result, for computational efficiency, maybe you really do only want to have one function that's going to be used to build core orbitals. And so how might you go about uh, designing which functions you're going to have in these double and triple and so on split, split uh, zeta basis sets, split valence? Well, one trivial approach, of course, would be, in fact, to say, listen, take the 1s orbital on hydrogen and STO3g. If I go look in the STO3g paper, you'll see these A sub I's have fixed values for certain values of alpha. That's what will be in the table, right? There will be three values, A1 associated with an alpha 1, and A2 associated with an alpha 2, and those will just give you shapes. And what I'll do is, maybe I'll keep the alpha 1, 2, and 3 values that were optimized in that paper, but now I'll just let these A's float. It becomes three basis functions instead of just one that is contracted from these three primitives. Now, Popel actually did something a bit more sophisticated than that. He optimized basis sets that were so-called split valence, and they tend to have these names, and you'll see these in computational papers. There's a number, a dash, a series of numbers, and a G. And what this implies is the G actually just is there to tell you it's a Gaussian basis set. So the number before the hyphen is an indication of how many primitives are there in all the core functions. So there's only one number because there's only one basis function for every core orbital. And in this particular basis set 321G, it will be, like the STO3G uh, basis function shown here, it'll be a contracted basis function formed from three primitives. It doesn't have to be three, it could be six. So for instance, there is a basis set called 621G. And that's telling you the difference is the, the core is described with a little bit more uh, flexibility. I shouldn't say flexible because it's not flexible, but it's a better shape because I built it out of six functions than out of three. Uh, now, the thing after the hyphen, those are the valence functions. So if you count how many numbers there are, that tells you the split level of the basis set. So there are only two numbers here. That means it is a double zeta basis set. So just to take an example, if this were to be carbon, that would say that for the second quantum level, which is the 2s orbital and the 2p orbitals, 
each one of those four different orbitals, 2s, 2px, 2py, 2pz, will have a tight basis function, which the 2 tells you it will be formed as a linear combination of two primitives, and it'll have a loose basis function. And the 1 tells you that function is just out there on its own, so it's not constructed out of primitives, it's just a function. So two tight primitives to make one tight basis function, one uh, loose function, which uh, is not constructed of primitives. So let's just do a quick little example of what that looks like. Counting up basis functions is an, you know, a useful exercise because the time you spend in a calculation is dictated to some extent by how many basis functions are there. The, remember that the number of basis functions gives you the dimension of the secular determinant that you need to solve and the total number of two electron integrals over molecular orbitals is n to the fourth power because there are capital N basis functions and there's as many molecular orbitals as there are basis functions so n to the fourth so as n gets big I start to have to evaluate a lot of integrals notice incidentally that if one of those basis functions that's adding up to n is itself a sum of contracted basis functions, well then that integral just got multiplied by all the sub-integrals I'm going to have to add together to get to that integral because I expanded my function as a sum of other functions. Okay, well in any case, let's actually now look at basis functions. So let's start with the easy one. This is ammonia. Let's look at the hydrogen atom in ammonia. There are three of those atoms. What kind of atomic orbitals are there in hydrogen up to valence? Well, actually, that's all there is. There are no core orbitals. There's just the 1s valence orbital. What's the degeneracy of a 1s orbital? Well, there's only one of them. How many basis functions will be involved? Well, I look up here for valence. This is a valence orbital. The valence orbitals are represented by one, two, two basis functions. So there are two basis functions that are brought to the game here. Now, how many primitive functions are there? Well, in that basis function for hydrogen, there will be a tight one that has two primitives and a loose one that has one primitive. So 2 plus 1 equals 3. So what is the total number of basis functions? That's the number of atoms times the number of basis functions. 3 times 2 equals 6. What's the total number of primitives? Well, that's again the number of atoms times the total number of primitives. That's 3 times 3 equals 9. Now let's do nitrogen. How many atoms are there? Just the one nitrogen in ammonia. What kind of orbitals does it have? It has a 1s core, a 2s valence, and a 2p valence. The degeneracy is 1, 1, and 3 for s, s, and p. The number of basis functions, a core orbital only has one basis function. The valence orbitals are two each. How many primitives are there? The core orbital has three primitives because this is 3, 2, 1, g. And each of the valence orbitals is 2 plus 1. So the answer is actually 3 for every single one of these cases. And now finally, when I add up the basis functions, I'll find, okay, 1 times 1. There's a single 1s on nitrogen. There are two 2s's on nitrogen. And there are six 2p's. It's double for each of the three px, py, pz orbitals. Uh, and the primitives, meanwhile, are 3, 3, and 9. So if I sum all these together, I discover a 3, 2, 1, g calculation, a Hartree-Fock 3, 2, 1, g calculation on ammonia would have 15 basis functions. So the secular determinant would be 15 by 15, and I'll be solving for 15 molecular orbitals but it would have 24 primitives, so the total number of two electron integrals I would end up solving would be 24 times 24 times 24 times 24, because they're all going to appear at some point in a, uh, an electron repulsion integral, and so 24 to the fourth power total integrals. It's a big number. Now, basis sets go on to include other things, and so here's a basis that Popel designed, 631G, so this is different from 3, 2, 1, g in that core orbitals are now contracted from six primitives, and the tight function is not contracted from two, but it's contracted from three. So it's got a little more uh, detail in its shape. And finally, the loose function continues to just be a single loose one. But here you see something new, and this is kind of older notation, star, star. So originally when Popel did this, the first star that you would see 
tells you to add so-called polarization functions. So that is a D function on a heavy atom. And by heavy here, I really am referring mostly to first and second row atoms uh, because that is what the original uh, work was done on. The D functions are six-fold degenerate. And if that seems a little curious, because you seem to remember there were only five uh, D orbitals, the key point is to call them functions here. So if you actually write down all the D functions in Cartesian coordinates, there are six of them. If you take a linear combination of them, you can show that you make the five canonical D functions, which if you remember your elementary uh, quantum mechanics, uh, they are usually not indexed by Cartesian coordinates. There's a D minus two and a D minus one and a D zero and a D one and a D two. So you do, you can represent those five, but you also make an S orbital. So think of it as like a D X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. And if you remember X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared, that looks like a sphere. So it, it looks like uh, S orbital. So it's an extra orbital that comes out of working in Cartesian coordinates is the best way to think about it. It does turn out now that in many programs, it, it's a bit of a toggle whether you use 6D orbitals or 5D orbitals, and it depends a bit on how the basis set was originally defined. But for the moment, I'll just say six-fold degenerate. The second star tells you to put P functions on the hydrogen atoms, and that's unambiguous. That's three-fold degenerate. There's a PX, a PY, and a PZ. And why might you want to do that? Why use polarization functions? Well, here's an interesting observation. If you do a Hartree-Fock calculation, so that's not hydrogen fluoride anymore, that's Hartree-Fock, on ammonia, and we just looked at how to do it on ammonia, but we're not going to use 321G, we're not going to use 631G, we're actually going to use an infinite basis set of S and P basis functions. Now, in practice, of course, nobody did infinite, but they did, you know, 10, 20, 50, 100. So lots and lots of S and P basis functions on nitrogen and S functions on hydrogen. When you do that calculation, you predict if you do a geometry optimization, that ammonia is planar. And we know ammonia is not planar, it's actually pyramidal. And Joe was so shocked by this, you see he gave it five exclamation points, so that's quite a bit of shock. And uh, part of the, the issue is that in the absence of polarization functions, you just can't describe the electron density quite as accurately as you'd like to. And to give you a feel for what a polarization function does, here is a molecular orbital of water. And I actually discussed this orbital in lecture a couple of days ago. It derives from the overlap of a p orbital on oxygen with the s orbitals taken out of phase on the two hydrogen atoms. And, you know, looking at it, sure, the black overlaps the black and the white overlaps the white. But what if I were to add a little bit of character of this d function? Right? It's not saying that oxygen has occupied d orbitals or anything. It's just a mathematical function I'm going to use to try to improve my description of where the electron density is in space. Well, if you look at it, this white overlapping with the white of this p orbital, it's going to increase the amplitude kind of down in this lower region. But this black part over here overlapping with white, well, that's going to annihilate amplitude in this region. So it has the effect of bending, polarizing, the p orbital of oxygen towards the two hydrogen atoms. And of course, that gives rise to better overlap. This now looks much more like sort of sigma bonds than it does over here. And that's the utility of these polarization functions. Now, we've now gotten to a stage where we use atoms all over the periodic table, and uh, you might want more than one set of polarization functions. If one set is good, maybe a, a loose set and a tight set is even better. And so the more the, the more rigorous way to now describe basis functions tends to be not with stars, and one should try to avoid saying something like 631G star, but instead to just specify 631G 3D 2F comma 2P. So that means on all the heavier atoms, I'm going to put 3D polarization functions and 2F polarization functions. So if D is good, F only improves my flexibility. And then after the comma, is how many polarization functions and what kind on hydrogen atoms, and technically on helium too, but it's pretty rare you do an interesting calculation on a helium atom. Now, uh, this basis set that I wrote here, while it's perfectly decent notation, is a little bit unbalanced. And what we mean when we say balanced is, it's been observed over many, many years that essentially every time you split the contraction and the valence, so you go from double zeta to triple zeta to quadruple zeta, you will get about as much improvement in the energy from adding polarization functions. 
So in a double zeta calculation, having gone from single to double, you get about as much as if you also, uh, you get as much again, that is, if you also add D functions on heavy atoms and P functions on light atoms. And now if I uncontract again, if I further split my valence space to triple zeta, I actually want to add a new set of D functions and the next higher set of angular momentum functions, F, on, uh, in the case of heavy atoms. So my heavies would go to 2DF and my hydrogen atoms, or, or helium, would go to 2PD. And if I now go to quadruple, well, then I'll have 3Ds and 2Fs and a G, and on the lights, 3Ps and 2Ds and an F. And so that reflects balance. That is, you are, you're paying as much attention to the decontraction as you are to adding higher angular momenta. Other basis sets that you will see in the literature, and I'll just call out sort of the naming convention here, the Dunning basis sets are relatively popular. They're usually named as CC something here. I've shown the case of P, V, N, Z, where N is a number or a letter. And uh, it's an acronym, and it stands for correlation consistent. And that means that Dunning optimized his contraction coefficients and his exponents for correlated calculations as well as Hartree-Fock calculations. Polarized means that there are polarization functions, and they follow the scheme that I just sort of alluded to. Namely, every time you decontract, you add a new higher angular momentum function, and you split all the lower ones one further. And then the N is either D for double, and the V is valence, sorry. So this is valence double zeta if it's D, valence triple zeta if it's T, quadruple, and if you go past that, you just start using numbers instead of saying quintuple, sextuple. Uh, so you will see those basis sets in the literature. One of the last things I want to mention is diffuse functions. So what if I have really loosely bound electrons? And when does that happen? Well, maybe I've got an anion, so it's got extra electrons, and they're usually not held all that tightly. Maybe I'm computing an excited state. So I've taken something out of a bonding orbital, and I've put it into a, presumably an antibonding orbital or some loosely held orbital. Rydberg states actually refer to excitations that are so high in energy typically, the electron almost sees underneath it just a positively charged state that it's orbiting around. It looks almost like an atom that's so far away. Uh, and all of these then involve loose electrons. So to do calculations on those kinds of uh, states or species, you know, if you don't have a function that puts density far away from a molecule, of course you can't predict an orbital. But is out there far away from the molecule. You, you can only predict what you provide basis functions to set amplitude in space with. And so so-called augmentation functions or diffuse functions are indicated in Dunning basis sets by AUG, A -U -G, or in Popel basis sets by this plus. And if there's a plus, it means that there are diffuse functions on the heavy atoms and usually only the valence space. Uh, so let's say it's a carbon it will have an extra s and an extra px, py, and pz. And the issue is that the exponents on those functions will be quite a bit smaller than the valence exponents. That is, those functions are decaying very slowly. And so they have reasonable amplitude quite far away from the atom. Now, if you see two pluses, 631 plus plus g, that implies there's also a diffuse S function on each one of the hydrogen atoms. So I, I usually tell people that I think that's a stupid thing to do uh, because if you think about a hydrogen on a heavy atom, maybe it's an angstrom away. Well, if you've got a diffuse function on the heavy atom, you've already got a function that has barely decayed by the time you get an angstrom away. So if I now put a diffuse function on hydrogen, it's kind of hard to tell that function from the one that's already on the heavy atom. So about the only time it's really useful to put diffuse functions on hydrogens is if you're generating a hydride somewhere along, say, a reaction coordinate. Okay, in that case, you've got a hydrogen that's almost all by itself and it needs to accommodate negative charge. So sure, now there's a good reason to have a diffuse function. Otherwise, I think it's usually just a waste of time and uh, it introduces instability from having functions that are hard to distinguish from one another when you're actually doing the SCF equations. But in any case, that's what the notation means. And so that's all you really need to remember is that these are exponents, added functions with exponents such that they decay slowly, and as a result, you're able to accommodate things like anions. And the general rule tends to be 
If you don't include these functions, you actually tend to do okay for molecular geometries, but you do very badly for the energies because you're basically forcing an electron, at least one electron, to be much closer to the rest of the molecule than it would otherwise like to be. And why are you forcing that? Well, because you didn't give it any basis functions that let it get away. Uh, so it, you can, for instance, do calculations on systems that can't be made uh, experimentally. So there are some molecules that will not bind an electron, at least not indefinitely. There are these things called resonances, where it might just stick to it very briefly. But many systems are known to have negative electron affinities. That is, they will spontaneously detach an electron if it's temporarily glommed onto them. But you can do calculations on those till the cows go home, because we tend to use these basis sets that are centered on the molecules. And when we say an electron leaves, well, it becomes a free electron. The, if you remember your elementary quantum mechanics, the wave function for a free electron is just a sine wave or a cosine. It's a, it's a standing wave. But we don't have any of those in our basis set, so how can that poor electron get away? So I, I, I bring these points up, hopefully not to be confusing, but to emphasize that the electrons have to go where the basis functions let them go, and they can't go anywhere else. And so thinking about the basis set is important because you need to pick a basis set that's appropriate to a problem at hand. All right, uh, and so I'm going to end this lecture, and it's, it's run on a little bit because I wanted to introduce some uh, review material at the beginning, but here's a little exercise that you should do and uh, convince yourself that you've got the right answer, hopefully. Let's pick another molecule. We did ammonia. Now I'm going to do phosphinous acid, somewhat exotic phosphorus acid, and we're going to use 631GDP. And what I want you to do is tell me how many basis functions and how many primitive functions are there for phosphinous acid with this basis set. And so you can take a look back at the ammonia example and maybe construct a little table just like that and uh, come up with an answer to this question. And for purposes of answering it, let's assume that there are indeed six D functions, not five, but six, uh, associated with this basis set. And we'll discuss the answer at some point a little later. Okay, that's it.